One of the challenges when thinking about weight loss, sustainable weight loss over a long enough period of time is how much is enough on a daily basis before an adaptation would take place that would correct it. So for example, if we were talking- You're asking ab- the right questions. You're asking <laughs> yeah, the right yeah. questions. So, so if we were talking about, let's just say one of your dietitians came to you and said, Lane, I've got this idea. I've got this patient who is truly by every metric, 50 pounds overweight. Like, you know, we could do it on lean body mass, body fat, whatever. But th- this, if this guy's 50 pounds lighter in a year, everything about his life has gotten better from a health perspective. And this person said, look, <clears throat> I'm going to double their protein intake. And let's not make it the extreme example of where you're getting an extra 150. Let's just say it's 100 calories or 75 calories. Mm-hmm. If you could create an energy deficit, and this, again, assumes that you can change nothing else. And I mean, there's so many silly assumptions. But think of this almost more as a thought experiment. If you could create an energy debt of 75 calories per day by a macronutrient shift to more protein, over a long enough period of time, could it be relevant? It could however what we're neglecting to talk about is is something i briefly mentioned which is metabolic adaptation and so i think this is the other big thing that confuses people they think energy in energy out these are static things that do not affect each other and the reality is they are intrinsically tied to each other so Anybody who's ever tried to lose weight, if you went on a, let's say a 500 calorie deficit per day, which is a a pretty significant deficit, um, do you just lose linearly one pound per week until you no longer exist and you (laughs) die because there's no more body weight? No, we all know that eventually like that plateaus, right? Now, part of that is just because you have less body mass, so your body has to expend less energy in order to just, you know, maintain upright posture and those sorts of things. But then there's also the neat component As you lose weight, you become spontaneously less active. We see this in animals all the way up to humans. Then, not just that, voluntary exercise tends to go down past a certain point. Like if you're very obese and you start to lose weight, it's not really going to affect this that much because you have such an energy surplus. Um, But especially people who are going average to lean, your your will to exercise will go down. Um, I've definitely experienced that during contests, perhaps getting very lean, you know, just having to like will myself to get up off the couch. Um, and then if you look at their BMR, you actually get a reduction in BMR above what you would expect based on the loss of lean tissue and fat tissue, because fat tissue is well somewhat metabolically active there's actually up to like on average a 15% reduction in BMR. So almost at every level of energy expenditure, your body is kind of fighting you to get back to homeostasis, to reestablish homeostasis. And so we see this in people who lose weight. So if we take people with the same lean body mass and fat mass, people who have never been obese, people who have been obese and weight reduced, the weight reduced people will have a lower BMR than the people that have never had to lose fat. And so it's like this evolutionary, uh, uh, John Speakman had a really good uh, paper on this, thinking about this kind of getting into set point theory, that we have this kind of native set point that the body likes to be at. And the idea is kind of, okay, what are, what are, what's regulating the ends of that set point? So we understand that if we get too lean, lose too much fat mass, we die. That's a really negative outcome for evolution, right? You can't pass on your DNA if you're dead. Um, At the higher ends, because there are there are things that work against obesity, like like we already talked about that NEAT goes up if you overfeed. Your BMR also goes up if you overfeed. But obviously, based on what's happening in society with this shift towards adiposity, the the regulations on the going up are not as strong as going down. And so if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, the, the risk of getting too overweight in the short term, because obesity is not going to kill you when you're 40. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the difference between you dying at 80 versus 70. That, that's what the research tends to suggest. The, the, risk, in the, short ter- the risk in the short term is predation or, or, you know, fighting or or that some sort of physical altercation where you can't defend yourself very well, or you can't run away. The risk of predation after man learned how to use tools 
pretty much went to zero. Uh, I mean, yes, you have shark attacks and you have these things, but I mean, they're essentially lightning strikes when humans get killed by animals or even other people. I mean, it's very, very rare. But then we look at the risk of starvation. It's very real even now in some parts of the world and was very real in this country until the 1900s. I mean, even into probably the early 1900s. And so it makes sense that the regulatory mechanisms were more powerful on that bottom end to prevent people from becoming too lean than they are on the top end. And so bringing this back to energy balance, you have to think of energy balance like a car that changes its gas efficiency based on how full the tank is. So think about if you had a car that when you have the gas tank filled all the way up, it gets horrible gas mileage. But as that gas tank starts to go down, and think about your gas tank as your, your body's adipose stores, your energy stores. As that gas tank starts to go down, you become more and more and more efficient to buy the time there's very little gas left. It's just sipping gas. It really is kind of a dramatic comparison, 